Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated to receive the Word of God. A reading from the book of Genesis. After Abraham made it treaty with Abimelech, El Lech. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. 
And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham told, built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on top of the altar and on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your own son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will pray the psalm responsibly by whole verse. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have on the reflects me in my mind and grieve in my heart? Day after day. How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, and my foes rejoice over that I have fallen. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to the Lord, for he has given me a picture. I will praise the name of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. And do not present your members to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will have no mastery over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Do you not know that if you present yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves, you were slaves to sin, you obeyed from the heart. That pattern of teaching that you were entrusted to. And having been freed from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what benefit did you then reap from those things that you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now, freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your benefit leading to sanctification, and the end is eternal life. For the payoff of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
also for the word of you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Jesus said, Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will never lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks. Praise Praise you, Lord. Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's a, a very well-known um, Bible story. We all heard about it. Why? I don't know, because it's really dark. But we all heard about it all of our Sunday school years. It's called uh, The Binding of Isaac. That's the, the title of it. And it's a pivotal passage, not only in the Hebrew Scriptures, but really in the whole Bible. And arguably, it is one of the best known and, and also one of the most disturbing stories in all of literature. Because it really makes us wonder, what is God thinking? Why would God ask such a thing? What kind of God promises a son to Abraham and Sarah, and through that son, descendants as numerous as stars in the sky or grains of sand on the seashore, only to then snatch it away, not just snatch him away, but tell Abraham to destroy him. Oh, okay, yes, and it starts off by saying, well, God, this was a test, right? God was testing him. That's no better, right? What kind of God makes a hundred-year-old man and his son go through that kind of agony only at the last minute to say, ha-ha, just messing with you, don't go through with it. This is God's idea of just messing with you? Really? But that's not the only weird thing about this passage. Right? There's a lot, there's a lot that's not quite right here in this whole story. Abraham. Abraham has already given up one son whom he loved, Ishmael. And now this one too? And yet, after all of that, not a trace, not a trace of anger. Not a trace of rebellion, not a word of protest, not even a double take. Maybe a little hesitation, but we don't even get to, to see that. That's not even told to us by, by the narrative. And this is the guy who argued with God, who haggled with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet he doesn't speak up to ask God to spare the life of his one and only beloved son, Isaac, the fulfillment of the promise. And then what about Isaac? That's another thing that's strange, right? Forget the Sunday school picture books, by the way. Isaac is not a 12-year-old boy. He is 30 years old here. He's 30 years old. He is a strapping young man. And here's this 100-year-old hundred hundred father going to tie up this young man in his prime, and there's no record of a struggle. Isaac just lets him do it. What's that all about? And it's, it's, it's questions like these. It's, it's the little things that aren't quite right. This and, and other features of the text that, that say that this is not the kind of moral lesson a lot of us heard about. That it, this is not just a God's way of telling us very graphically, oh, we don't do human sacrifice. That's not there. And that's not that God is in favor of human sacrifice, but that's not the purpose of this story. That's not what's going on. So what is going on? Well, in order to find that out, I think the first thing we need to do is, is sort of back off and let the text speak for itself. Rather than us come to the text and bombard it and try to, to cross-examine it and get God to answer the questions that we're bringing to the text, let's find out what kind of questions God wants to answer in this text. This is the kind of thing that we do. We have our own concerns, we have our own questions, but they aren't necessarily the same concerns that the text has. I, I heard a rabbi talk about this once. He says the book of Jonah. He was teaching the book of Jonah, and some of his students says, well, this is stupid. We shouldn't, we shouldn't 
take the book of Jonah seriously. Because after all, fish don't swallow people and then travel three days and, and 2,500 miles and spit them out on land 700 miles inland and they live to tell the tale. That's not the way things work. It's not realistic. It's not real. The text doesn't care about that. That's not the question that the story of Jonah is supposed to answer. Similarly, right, you and I come to this text with all kinds of questions of our own, right? We come to this text with questions about obedience and, and dominance and, and freedom and autonomy and power and control and who's in charge and can God make demands like this and why would God do this and we loathe any suggestion that there should be submission to anything like this, right? That the best, the best we might expect from Abraham is compliance, but certainly in a matter as serious as this, he ought to at least speak up. And those are all perfectly good considerations. They're all perfectly good issues that we need to spend time grappling with. Is it ever okay to kill a human being? What, what makes a human being anyway? Right? When is killing murder? Right? Is human sacrifice okay or isn't it? Right? These are all huge, important issues. They're just not the issues that this particular text wants us to think about. I think I've, I've mentioned before that one of the ways we can get at what the text is really interested in is by looking at it and seeing what kind of themes, what kind of motifs, what, what words and phrases pop up repeatedly and grab our attention over and over and over again. And there's some of that in here. In, in the course of only, of only 14 verses, right, there's a couple of phrases that recur in there, almost like a, almost like a refrain. And the first one that pops out is, here I am. Right? Early, in the, early in the reading, the very first couple of verses, God calls out Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. And at the end, God calls out again, Abraham, Abraham, through, the, through an angel. God calls out through this messenger, this angel, here I am. I mean, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am again, here I am. And then in the middle of the story, right smack dab in the middle, Isaac says, my father. And Abraham answers, here I am, my son. Right? So this here I am is important somehow. And the other piece that's, that's interesting in, in terms of both the repetition and its placement is there's a, there's a phrase, and it appears like, like bookends around that whole little dialogue section between Abraham and Isaac. And it starts out with the phrase, so they went, both of them together. So they went, both of them together. My father, here I am. Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? God will provide. And then again, so they went, both of them together, like bookends. And there's a third motif, and I'll get to that in a minute. But listen to that. Here I am. They went, both of them together. Here I am. God will provide. They went, both of them together. Here I am. Here we have this passage that describes this very disturbing scene of a man about to, 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 to stick a knife in his own son. The passage is so full and dark and heavy with foreboding and, and, and ugliness and evil and tragedy and violence and loss, and yet the skeleton of this whole passage are these words of stability, these words of faithfulness, these words of endurance, these, these, these words of perseverance, of belonging, of loyalty, of faithfulness. Here I am. They went, both of them, together. Here I am. They went, both of them together. Here I am. And there's something of a resonance here. We've been in the uh, in our, our Wednesday uh, Christian formation class, how to how and why to be an Anglican. Um, we've been reading a book by Father Victor Austin. Um, he's a priest at uh, St. Thomas Fifth Avenue in the city, uh, but he's written a, a little brief introduction to. Ethics called Christian Ethics, a Guide for the Perplexed. 
And we're almost finished with that book, and we've just got two weeks left and two chapters left, so we're going to finish it in the next two weeks. Uh, but the chapter that comes up this week is, is precisely on that topic of loyalty, of perseverance. He calls it friendship. It's about being a friend. That's what this is about. It's about mutual love given and received in, in fidelity and commitment and mutual vulnerability. Friendship, he says, is the epitome of ethics. And friendship with God is the goal of Christian ethics in particular. And Abraham is the paradigm of friendship in the Bible. Look at it, just in light of this, this one passage that we see today, right? What do friends do? Friends do what Abraham does. They are unfailingly there for one another. Here I am. They stay with one another. They remain present to one another. They are available to one another in a moment's notice. They will go with you through thick and thin. They went on, both of them together. Friends don't withhold anything from each other. Before and during and after the hardest of trials, the greatest of ordeals, they will share even what is dearest and most essential to them. Your friend will share the shirt off their back and more. There is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. Even in the midst of fear and trembling, a friend will support you, a friend will be there for you, but a friend won't support you blindly. A friend will tell you when you're wrong. The one thing a friend won't do is abandon you. You see, Abraham and God are friends. Abraham's called a friend repeatedly throughout the scriptures. And God, too, has done what a friend does. What do friends do? They, they push you not to shirk the hard stuff. They encourage you and urge you and, 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 and back you so that you can face the hard stuff, face the difficulties head on, the painful chapters in life, to try things regardless of the outcome. Because regardless of the outcome, that's where you find grace. That's where you find out who you are. And that's where you find out who God is. And that's where you find out who your friends are. And that's where you find out that God is indeed your friend. And the other big takeaway here is that friendship with God is not in competition with friendship with anybody else. The better my friendship with God, the better friend I am to others. The better friend I am to others, the richer and deeper my friendship with God becomes, the more I become willing to trust the more, the less, the less grasping and protective and defensive I become of myself and my own agenda, and the more willing I am to let God provide. It's all of a piece. Even Abraham and Isaac here, right? I don't think we need to cast Abraham in the in the the, the, the harsh, the harsh light of a of a, a murderer or a bloodthirsty religious fanatic. He's not a pawn in some cosmic game here. He's not an automaton. He's not under a spell. He's not stupid. Every account we have of Abraham is of a man who is overflowing with hospitality and generosity, willing to share what he has to open his, his house, his life, his home to whoever needs it. And he is a tender father. He loves his children passionately. He feels deeply. But his friend God has asked for something big. And instead of making excuses, instead of pushing back, instead of bowing out of the relationship, he responds as a friend. He doesn't run away. I don't think he sees a way out of it. I don't think he understands how this is going to work out. I think it's tearing him up inside. But he's not going to run away. He's not going to abandon God, and he's not going to abandon Isaac. What he does do 
is leave the, jo the door ajar for God to work. God will provide. So with this story, this, this very short story, these 14, depending on how you count them, 21 verses, what this is not about, this is not a story about white-knuckled compliance with with an unconscionable demand from a, a, a powerful and, 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 and tyrannical deity who will punish if you don't do exactly as he says. This is a story of friends encountering something very hard. And Abraham will be a faithful friend and will stick with God and will not abandon him or us. And Isaac, I think, sees this. I think that's the secret to why Isaac doesn't resist. Abraham may be holding the knife right now, but Isaac also knows that Abraham sent Ishmael away, but kept him. And then whether his life ends now or 150 years from now, that somehow this is part of that promise that his father's God made to Abraham that his own God, the God he will call his own, made. That this is part of the way it happens. And that his life is full of blessing and mercies that he has not earned and does not deserve. And he doesn't know either how he's going to stick it out, how he's going to be faithful, how he's going to keep from running away. But somehow or another, that example of friendship is right there for him. It's not a story about domination. It's not a story about power. It's not about control. It's not about bondage or a lack of intelligence or a lack of insight or a lack of heart. It's about fidelity and stability and faithfulness, come what may, through sickness, health, poverty, tragedy, even through betrayal and failure and sin. Jesus calls one person in particular friend twice in the Gospels, and that's Judas. He calls Judas his friend. This is the real core reality, folks. This is the reality of what it means to be Christian. It means friendship with God, and it bears fruit in friendship with others. That refusal to walk away, even when things are the darkest and bleakest and worst and most painful, not walking away is what it's about. I said there was a third motif, and that is substitution. God does provide the lamb. We know about this. We know about this from the Easter proclamation. It says Jesus Christ is the true Paschal lamb, who at the feast of the Passover delivered God's faithful people by his blood. How wonderful and beyond our knowing, O God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us that to redeem a slave, you gave away a son your only son, the son you love, through whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand now and join us in professing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one of God, the Father, the Father Almighty, Almighty, Maker, Maker of, of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of but one being with the Father, through him all things are made, for us and, and for our salvation. He came, came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became a part of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped 
glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on Dolores, Lynn, Barbara, Jennifer, Henley, Bob, David, Henry, Danny, Dick, John, Fema, Nancy, Jay, and all who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to Alice Kempf, Joseph Pavlik Sr., Thomas Simmons, and all the departed eternal rest. That thy perpetual shine upon them. Let your blessing be upon Ed Keegan, Sarah Katsonis, Anne Marie Soika, Rebecca Fingar, John Meathead, Robert Tink, Father John Cairns, Father Gabriel Morrow, and all who celebrate milestones this week. That they may grow in grace to trust your wisdom and love. We praise you for the Blessed Ever Virgin Mary, St. Paul, St. Benedict, Blessed Daniel Nash, and for all your saints who have entered into joy. We may also come to share in your service in the kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise, praise and thank you for this, your diocese of all Albany. Inspire and sustain us in this time of transition. Incline our hearts to do your will, and so direct us in your ways that the leader you are raising up to be our bishop will find here joyful disciples making disciples, united in faith, unflagging in hope, Steeped in mutual charity. In, in your mercy, mercy accept, accept our repentance and grant us peace. peace. Look with patience upon our enthusiasms. Pour rich gifts, gifts and grace on all who are trusted with the ongoing work of your church, so that with the diligence and charity we may discern correctly the walk righteously in your ways. And let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. But also with you. to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
The Lord be with you. Also, with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we pray to you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and to death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is alive, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will, will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And following his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. On the last day, bring us, with all of your saints, into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, O mighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we would have dealt with two trespasses in this house, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God.
stand and pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Christ our Lord. Amen. And a member of our parish is uh, moving away. She's moving down to Westchester County to be closer to her uh, one of her sons. And uh, we have a card for her in the back of the church. Please uh, sign it before you leave church today. And we'll present that to her before she leaves. And the other thing is that we have um, decided to uh, to open the church on Saturday mornings during the uh, farmer's market for a couple of hours. So from 10 to noon, the church will be open. People can come in and uh, if they want, they can sit and pray, they can read, they can admire our beautiful architecture and our stained glass and all our other wonderful, beautiful things, and they can learn a little bit about our church and our community. Um, but for that to happen, people need to be here to, to sort of open the church and, and greet visitors and um, hand out the literature. You don't have to, there's no, no special skills involved, no special knowledge needed. Um, you just, there's the blue, the blue folders, the blue folders in the back that uh, tell about the, uh, the history of St. Paul's and the things inside the church, so uh, just basically be a smiling, welcoming presence and, and share the love of God with them. Um, so um, if you would want to do something like that, it's only one weekend, probably, if we, if we if keep enough people sign up, it's just one weekend, it's just for July and August, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board as you go out, it'll be on the left on the bulletin board there, so sign up for a weekend in July or August. And that is it for the announcement. Please stand and pray for blessing. May the God of mercy grant you blessings and peace all the days of your life. Amen. May he free you from fear, worry, and doubt, and strengthen your hearts in his love. Amen. May he grant you his gifts of faith, hope, and love, so that your life may be bountiful and you may find fulfillment in his eternal kingdom. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.